We're at a remarkable moment in history. For the first time in a generation, it's cool to be philosophical. It's fine to quote great men from history or great women with propositions and thoughts. We've had a period of agnostic hedonism, and now we want to rediscover what purpose is all about. One of the finest quotes I know on purpose is that from Gandhi. Gandhi said, if you want to find yourself, you have to lose yourself in the purposes of others. Jesus, who I trust, said that if you want to get life and hold on to it, you have to let it go in order to get it by communicating what is good news in order to set others free. Now here we are at this fascinating moment in our history when people who have everything technological and everything physical are longing for the one thing they cannot find easily, which is great purpose. And I want to take you on a little bit of my personal journey and tell you why purpose matters to me so much and why it matters not just in my political life, but why it matters in my business life and my personal life. I grew up in my early years in the UK and then moved to Jamaica. My father was from Angola, my mother was half Panamanian, and my grandfather was Indian. So I'm not quite sure exactly what I am. Tempted to say I'm Scottish, but then again, <laughs> when I think about it, all the different elements that went into shaping my life came from people in my family background who lived with a strong sense of purposeness. So here we are in Jamaica, and we get to the point of 1970. And the wise Jamaican people, under a democratic system handed over by the British, decide that it's right to elect a government that is pro-Cuban. Now, for many of you who are here, you won't realize how significant that was. In the period of the Cold War, to side up with Cuba, which of course was being resourced by Russia, was a bad deal. And immediately, the Americans began to move against Jamaican industry to close down as much as they possibly could in order to punish Jamaica to come back to the core right center. But that was not to happen. And as a child, I witnessed a dramatic change take place. A country which was named as out of many one people, that's its motto, all of a sudden stopped to have the great multicolors that made the frame of Jamaican life. It turned instead into being the black against the white. And I watched the breakdown of white society with the anger of black communities, the growth of the gang culture, the enormous rise of the ganja culture, and the incredible anguished anger of the music that became so typical of Jamaica. I watched people violate one another in the streets as a young child at the age of 10. And I remember thinking at the time, this place is in meltdown. It wasn't long before we found that it was impossible to buy ordinary things in the shops, to get soap, to get soup, to get cereals, to get the basic products of everyday life. And my mother used to struggle intensely. My father was a dental surgeon. He would go out every day seeking to make other people's lives and their mouths better, and would come back very often depressed and in despair. My mother was the one who tried to make home hang together, but the shops got emptier. And this particular magic moment happened. It was when a box arrived from a set of aunts who had moved away from Jamaica and gone to Canada. They had read the terrible stories of destitution, the lack of shop equality, the lack of products in the shops, the fact that we simply couldn't get basic commodities. And they sent us a box which contained onions on the outer ring, soap on the inner ring, and apples in the middle. Strange combination. What would you cook with that? <laughs> but immediately when the box arrived and my mother opened it, and I remember standing there watching her literally pick out one onion, one soap, one onion, one soap, add an apple, one onion, one soap, one onion, one soap, add an apple. And by the time she had gone all the way around the box, there was one onion left, one soap, and no apple. And that was all that was left for us. For her decision was that in order to exemplify to us what it meant to be purposeful, she was going to give away what we had just received that we never had. I learned in that magic moment that for me, purpose had to be about the gift of giving away. Having gone through university in the UK, having trained to be a teacher, I then began my first teaching career in a school in West London. 
Within a few short months, found myself driving into London, and there was a man in a wheelchair. A man with no legs, but pumping his way in the middle lane on the Euston Road, attempting to get to Euston Station. But he was at least a mile and a half away from Euston Station. I remember bumping my little old car up against the pavement and thinking I must rush into the middle to find out if there's something wrong with him. When I did, in the midst of the traffic, get to him, and we managed to have a conversation against the noise of the road, I asked him what he was doing, and he said, I have to, I have to get to Euston Station. I said to him, you can't possibly continue to pump your wheelchair in the middle of three lanes of traffic this way and three lanes of traffic that way before you go to the underpass. So he said, you can take me. I pushed him up on the pavement, pushed him along until we got to Euston Station, and having got him into the station, he then said to me, you can't leave yet, I have to go to the toilet. I took him to the toilet, I took him into the toilet, thinking at that point I may leave him. At which point he said, no, you have to put me on the toilet. He had no legs. I put him on the toilet, the door had to stay open, he completed what he needed to do and I had to tidy him up. It was then necessary to put him back into his chair and then to say, can I leave you at this moment? And he said, no, you can't. You need to shave me. In the old days, before AIDS, we used to have shavers in the stations. You pop a coin in, it pops out, you shave yourself. Not anymore since blood and infections. But it was possible then to do it. And I put a coin in, out popped the shaver, and I shaved him all over. At which point I then said to him, can I leave you now? And he said, yes. And I remember thinking very carefully at that moment, I didn't have to stop. I didn't have to push him further. I didn't have to go into the toilet with him. I didn't have to tidy him up. I didn't have to shave him. And if I had done none of those things, he would never know and I would never know either. But what I would have done is killed something important inside of me. I would have denuded and denoted something of vital importance to human life. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is an American philosopher and poet, said the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to make it make more difference that you have lived and have lived well. At the age of 16, I told my closest friend at school, the boarding school that I was attending, that I was going to be in Parliament. I didn't know why I said it. I didn't know what I thought I could possibly do to get there. But I knew at the age of 16 that I was motivated by the same energy I'd watched from my mother. I wanted to be in a position where I could make a radical difference to others. And I framed a proposition in my mind. And this is it. I sat down this morning to write the words exactly as I remembered them at 16 years old. And I remember saying to my closest friend then, this is what will matter to me forever. To bend the power of the prosperous towards the potential of the poor. To open doors, to engender enthusiasm, to empower change. I've just come back from witnessing some remarkable events around the world. Working for KPMG, which is an audit tax and business advisory service, I get to see incredible things done in the name of powerful business. I'm not a cynic about business. I never have been a cynic about business. I'm not foolish about profit making. I'm realistic about how the world turns. I understand how political power needs to be balanced and how difficult it is for those who have power to make decisions when we're easily sitting there criticizing and being cynical. So I've given up on cynicism. I think it's vital if you're going to have purpose to abandon cynicism altogether. The two don't hold together. Cynicism blames, but purpose is about engagement, activity, commitment, and sacrifice. So what I have just seen in the last few weeks has been quite remarkable. In Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, witnessing in the 20-year celebrations of KPMG in that country, we undertook to give 1,000 operations to people who were blind because of cataracts. 1,000 operations that cost $44 each that would be taken over the course of this last year. 
In the end, in fact, we did 1,315 operations. But I was there to witness the 1,000th operation literally a week and a half ago. To see, as I did with four different operations, a woman's eye, in fact, two women and two men with their eye cut open while they're still awake, to see the cataract removed, and to see a new lens popped in, for the first time for people who've never had their sight or lost their sight 10 to 20 years ago, to witness the fact that within a short space of time they would recover sight altogether for a tiny injection of cash that we could afford and they could never. Why was it so important to me? Because my mother went blind from cataracts. She couldn't get in Jamaica what she needed in order to give her the opportunity of free operations that would set her free. And the last 11 years of her life, she spent completely blind. But to witness in Vietnam that what a business could do was not just resource this difference, but was to give the ability of gifted time to sit alongside people who come from far out villages and communities, to encourage them to go through the process of assessment, to use mobile technology as a way of communicating with them to get them in in the first place, to then support them through the short operation of just 20 minutes, to help them in the recovery process and to monitor and follow their stories. This is not philanthropy. This is purposeful, purposeful engagement and commitment. To me, it has been wonderful to see that. And then just recently also to sit with people from the Aboriginal communities in Northern and Western Australia, to watch the way in which our business, alongside 23 others, has given people five weeks' time to go out and help build the capacity of indigenous Australian organisations, to turn the potential of those indigenous Australians, those first Australians who were there before the whites ever came, to turn their potential away from having been just written off as alcoholics and uneducated into being men and women who can control their own destinies and turn the resources of Australia's $40 billion a year spent on that community to their own hands. And then to work as we are doing on constitutional change so that the opportunity of those people to be first Australians gives them the same dignity as every Australian has in the rest of the country. These things are remarkable to get engaged in the process of changing nations and communities, as we are at the moment working with the mining industry in South Africa, helping them rethink how to recover the dignity lost as a result of the deaths around the Lonmin mine two years ago. What to do to give back to workers who previously felt that mining was once the only hope they had and then they lost a vision for it altogether because they felt they were under-resourced, underpaid and unsupported. And to recover something which is an important product for the country of South Africa, but a vital lifeline for the many workers who work in those communities. All the millions that we have spent on building schools in the UK and Academy in Hackney, which has delivered the most outstanding results this last summer or the multitudinous literacy running campaigns that we have around the world. None of these are casual. And in particular for me, every year, the journey I make to a tiny village on the edge of Tanzania called Pemba Island, in the top right-hand corner where 10,000 people live. And when I first went there six and a half years ago with my younger son, to witness what I saw as pre-civilization, people who had no sanitation, who were living literally in mud huts, who had no electrification, no schools, no clinics, no pharmaceuticals, no doctors, no maternity care whatsoever, no jobs, no electrification, no shops, and no fresh water. And six years on, as we have continued to work with not just the expenditure of resources and the millions we've put into it, but the time, the commitment, the skills, and the energy that passionate people in professional services can bring to turn around to create 2,500 jobs in the seaweed farming industry, to set people free by making wonderful crafts that we're now selling into the United States, to build a maternity clinic so three women at a time can give birth in air-conditioned safety, to make sure there are permanent doctors and nurses on site and in place. And when I pay my final visit next September with teams who come with us from around the world, we will finally say to those 10,000 people, what we have aimed to do for you is to set you free. That purpose is about giving ourselves away for other people's freedoms. I was reading an edition of Fortune magazine recently which analyzes great companies. On the front cover, in fact, in an edition which was looking at the, at the greatest 50 leaders in business in the world, there is a quote from Bill Clinton, the former US president. 
More people, he said, can be great leaders than they think they can, but they need a purpose greater than themselves. Gallup published a remarkably interesting poll in September of 2014. They interviewed 133,000 people around the world in 135 countries. And the poll revealed this. The world, they said, faces a shortage of purpose and a lack of well-being. Here's the outstandingly awkward figure. Just 18% of people overall in the world feel they have a purpose. 18%. In fact, the highest numbers of people with a purpose are in Latin America at 37%, but in Europe, it's just 22% of people feel that they have a purpose. The problem with our hedonistic and agnostic age, it has left so many of us empty, purposeless, and lacking any sense other than the next day's occasion or the delight of the weekend. Every year, I love to read the 100 greatest leaders in the world that Time Magazine publishes. This year, inside their edition, which celebrates remarkable people who we all know well, there is a page written up by the actor Forrest Whitaker. He takes the particular story of a lady called Sister Rosemary. Sister Rosemary is from Uganda. Sister Rosemary is working to care for women who've been abused, to work for women who've been raped, and to stand alongside women who don't know how to make anything of their lives, having been abandoned. The picture of her is full of the joy of what she's doing. And these are the words that Forrest Whitaker writes about her. For girls who were forcibly enlisted as child soldiers, Sister Rosemary has the power to rekindle a bright light in eyes that have long gone blank. For women with unwanted children born out of conflict, she allows them to become loving mothers at last. The traumas she heals are unfathomable, and the reach of her love is boundless. We find purpose in bending ourselves to the interests of others. We find purpose in identifying the reason for which we were born and the reason for which others will record the joy of our death. We find purpose when we choose to move away from the self-indulgence that perpetuates our modern society. We find purpose when we work and we give, but we start, first of all, with the call that lies upon all of us, which is to choose life and in choosing life, we get the greatest of it by giving it away. So here we are at the moment when we will reflect on 100 years since the First World War. 100 years in which we will look back over the many, many, many tens of millions that have died and the consequences of the first, the second, and the other wars that have followed. And here is a meditation sent to me this last week, which says, what have we learned in the course of these 100 years? We've taller buildings but shorter tempers wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We spend more but have less. We buy more but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences, le yet less time. We have more degrees but less sense. More judgment but less judgment. More experts but more problems. We have more gadgets but less satisfaction. More medicine but less wellness. We take more vitamins but see fewer results. We drink too much, smoke too much, spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get angry too quickly, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too seldom, watch too much TV, and pray too seldom. We've multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and lie too often. We've learned to make a living but not a life. We've added years to life and not life to years. May you find your purpose. Thank you.